Hello, everyone. My name is George or Chong Kam Kwok. I'm very happy to be here to give this presentation, Introduction to Cantonese. In this slide, I'm going to give you a roadmap to outline what I'm going to cover in this presentation. The presentation will first give an introduction to the speakers of the language and some discussion on the sociolinguistic situation of Cantonese as well. Then we will talk about the structure of the language, especially the morphology and the phonology. So of course, uh, every language is complex and therefore we can't take a look at every single one of the experts. And therefore, I'm only going to cover some of the main or most uh, distinctive features, especially uh, the tone in the phonological aspects of Cantonese, the consonants, and some syllables. And in terms of morphology, I'm going to cover the adverbial structures and some aspects marker in verbs as well. If it is something you are not very familiar with, it just means some adverbs in Cantonese and some tense markers in Cantonese to signify whether a sentence or an action happened in the past or in the future or in present. Okay. As you can see on the map, uh, Cantonese is the most widely known and influential var variety of Chinese other than Mandarin in China. And Cantonese is spoken primarily in the southern China province of Guangdong, as you can see in the red area on the China map on the top of the slide, at the top of the slide. And Cantonese is not spoken by everyone in Guangdong province. And in a circle at the bottom picture of the slide, you can see the pink area. The people in the pink area are the people who spoke, who speak uh, Cantonese as their native language. And you can see a yellow circle in the uh, at the bottom part of the at the bottom part of the picture, and you can see that uh, that is Hong Kong, and most people in Hong Kong speak Cantonese as their mother tongue. Although a lot of people would associate Cantonese as a minority language or a dialect or uh, not the major language in China, it is actually it. Uh, it actually has a lot of speakers. According to the uh, Anthrolog, the 2021 version, there are 85 million speakers of Cantonese in the world, making it the 18th most spoken language in the world. And it is a lingua franca of Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Guangdong province, and some overseas Chinese communities, such as Vancouver, uh, some parts of Malaysia and some part of Singapore as well. And then we will look further at the written system and the spoken system of Cantonese Chinese at a rather superficial level here. We will go deeper in the following few slides. Here we can see that in Hong Kong, people write in traditional Chinese. This is the same as Taiwan. However, in mainland China, people use simplified Chinese as their written language. And then in the spoken form, Cantonese people, of course, use Cantonese. And Mandarin speaker are not only limited to uh, people in mainland China, but also people in Taiwan and also a lot of overseas Chinese communities as well. So as you can see here, 
uh, the traditional Chinese, as you can see, uh, is in the middle of the table. And the simplified Chinese is on the right hand side of the table. And as you can see here, although we say that the two regions use different written system, the difference between traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese should not be overly exaggerated. So some of the characters are the same and most of them are different. Entity. Cantonese has been an identity marker of Hong Kong people for decades. As the tension between Hong Kong and China growing over the past 10 years or so, Cantonese's role as an identity marker also increases. In the past few years, the Hong Kong government has been pushing hard to use Mandarin instead of Cantonese as a medium of instruction in the Chinese curriculum at school. This has caused a lot of concerns about the status of Cantonese in Hong Kong and the erosion of Hong Kong identity. And recently, as we can see in the picture, Hong Kong's Secretary for Education made a remark saying, learning Chinese using Cantonese is not sustainable because the teaching of Chinese in the world relies on Mandarin. The government is accused of denigrating Cantonese and this also caused a lot of concern as well because people think that what happened in Guangdong province would be happening in Hong Kong. And what happened in Guangdong province is something we are going to look at in the next slide. So if you remember, I have shown you a map a few minutes ago, and then you can see that uh, only part of Guangdong province use Cantonese as their native language. And uh, the Cantonese is also associated with identity in Guangdong province, or at least people in Guangzhou also attach a lot of values to Cantonese. And one example is the support Cantonese protest that happened in 2010. The background of this protest is there were proposals for Guangdong's main television company to broadcast primarily in Mandarin. And the proposals angered a lot of citizens in Guangdong province because they fear that Cantonese is being sidelined by the governments. And therefore, you can see in the picture, many people took to the streets in July 2010 to show the support of Cantonese. Tell you that you may find quite a lot of variations between the romanization systems in Cantonese. Uh, at least three to four popular romanization systems. You can see if you are learning Cantonese or if you are interested in Cantonese, uh, it may not be obvious to you, but uh, at least there are three to four major romanization systems in Cantonese. The Guangdong Romanization System, published by the Guangdong Province Education Department, the Hong Kong Cantonese Romanization Scheme developed by the Linguistic Society of Hong Kong in 1993. Um, the Yale Romanization of Cantonese developed by uh, B.F. Wang and Gerald Kwok in 1950s, in the 1950s. And in order to make it more consistent, I'm going to use the Hong Kong Cantonese Romanization Scheme in the rest of this presentation. So when I show you the examples, I'm going to use Hong Kong Cantonese Romanization Scheme. So first, uh, we are going to talk about the tones in terms of phonology. 
we are going to talk about the tones first because it is at least to me uh, it is the most intriguing part of Cantonese and many people say that there are nine tones in Cantonese however uh, linguists would normally agree that there are six distinctive tones in Hong Kong Cantonese and the seventh eighth and the ninth tones they are normally perceived or thought as the shorter version of tone one tone three and tone six if it is not very clear i think there is no better way of showing the tones by giving you some examples uh, so you can see the numbers here from one to six and these numbers represent the six distinctive tones in Hong Kong Cantonese. The first one, Fu, means husband. The second tone, Fu, means tiger. The third tone, Fu, means deputy. Or uh, vice, for example, vice president, uh, vice chairman etc the supporting part of then the supporting role of an, an organization or in position the fourth one fu means support the fifth tone fu means wife the sixth tone means father and you can see here this is there are six tones and every tone represents a different word and this word and each word carries a different meaning so if you mispronounce one tone then the meaning of the whole sentence will be different i'm going to give you one more example to show the other three quote unquote tone. <clears throat> so uh, the three other tones are highlighted here. And when I say it, I hope that you can you can feel that they are just a shorter version of tone one, tone three, and tone six. The first tone C and then the, the seventh tone, sick, sick, as opposed to C in the first tone, the seventh one is shorter. The third tone, C, means, C means try. And the variation of it is the eighth tone, that is sad sag so it is shorter and then the ninth tone is the shorter version of the sixth tone the sixth tone is c and the ninth tone is sec so it is a shorter version of the sixth tone okay so we have just looked at some distinctive features of the cantonese tones Next, we are going to look at some tone changes in Cantonese. The main tonal change occurs in compounds and rejudicated expressions, as we can see below in the examples. Like uh, fei, fei, dei means rather fat or chubby. You can see here, FEI4 denotes the first character, Fei, but FEI2 denotes the second character, Fei. They are the same character, but because in this context, the Cantonese pronunciation or the Cantonese tone 
often change when you have the marker here. A, uh, when, when you have uh, some compounds like uh, they to describe it is a little bit. Uh, so it changes when it has this kind of situation. And it occurs primarily where the second syllable of the compound or the reduplicated word has a non-high tonal. And the, uh, we can see, we can look at another example here, <clears throat> like Ming Ming Dei. Again, the first one, the first character, Ming, we use the fourth tone, as you can see here. And, but the second character, which is actually the same as the first one, but in this situation, we use the second tone, Ming. So Ming Ming Dei, again, Dei here means a little bit. So it is roughly understand. We roughly understand. And uh, so Dei. And tone changes also happens in long works. As many of you may know, uh, Hong Kong is a former British colony, and therefore a lot of works in modern day Cantonese borrow are borrowed from uh, borrowed from English. So, um, as you can see here, cheese in Cantonese ji si the sorry. In a normal case scenario, it is pronounced C, but because it is a long word, it, 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 it is not written in stone, but it just happens in a lot of long works. So, and, but in this case, you can see it changes to the second tone C, so G C instead of G C. And here, and you can also see da, the second character in the second example of this slide. Uh, o da, and this da is second tone as well, means order. Then we are going to look at some consonants in uh, Cantonese. You can see here, uh, I'm not going into the detail here. Uh, instead, I want to show you that uh, you can see in the picture here, in, in the table here, Cantonese has many consonants that are the same as English, but they are not exactly the same. For example, we don't have the R sound in Cantonese, the R consonant in Cantonese. And therefore, many Cantonese speakers have difficulties pronouncing the words run, as in R-U-N. And when in a daily conversation, you may find it difficult to understand whether they mean one, W-O-N or run. R U N, and the same happens to learners of Cantonese too. In English, because the English stops, for example, the P and B, and versus the Cantonese stops here P. So, uh, if we say because we don't have R in Cantonese, therefore it may have some difficulty for Hong Kong people to pronounce one and run. This is the same for English speaking people. 
because in the Chinese world, in the Cantonese world, Bei, the second tone, as we can see here, Bei, the stop B. Because this sound is, if we look at the English B, English ba, ba sound, the, uh, it is voiced, but it is not in Cantonese. And uh, if we look at the English p sound, because it has aspiration, like p, but Cantonese has not much aspiration in this p sound, in this bei sound. And therefore, the chances are English speakers, they found it very difficult because it sometimes it may sound like Sometimes it may sound like p, but actually uh, it is something like in the middle. It, it is not voiced and it has very little aspiration. And this will make, will pose some difficulties for learners of Cantonese. And here is the vowel systems of Cantonese. Mm, there are 11 vowels and 11 diphthongs in Cantonese and seven of the vowels are long vowels and four of them are short. Um, so because of time constraints, I think I'm not going to look into the vowels here. Rather, I would like to talk about something more interesting. Uh, which is the syllable structure. Like Mandarin, Cantonese has a relatively simple syllable structure. The possible combinations of sounds are severely restricted and no consonant clusters. Like um, in English, you have uh, one word can have many syllables. For example, is the word, for example, the word syllable, one word, but three syllables. Okay. As I told you before, there are three different major ways to form complex work structure in Cantonese. There are no better ways than giving you an example to get my point clear. Let's look at some examples. The first one, reduplication, doubling of words or syllables. We can see here the highlighted area. Zek zek means if we just say zek, that means one, like one cat is beautiful. But if we have zek zek, here, so we here is the doubling of the word z, then it means each and every one of them is beautiful. So they are all beautiful. All the cats are beautiful. So this type of structure normally is normally used like before the noun or sometimes it can be omitted. The noun can be omitted if the context is clear. And then we have affixation, prefixes and suffixes. Is not prefix or suffix in the sense like English prefixes and suffixes, but it is more like a modifier to give some meaning or give some mood to the character or to the word. As we can see here, tai, the highlighted area in the, uh, in the uh, middle part of the slide, tai, hou means good, tai means look, looking. 
So hou tai means good looking. So very easy to understand. Again, hou xiu, the second example. Xiu means laugh, laughter. And hou xiu means laughable or hilarious. So the hou here acts like a prefix in Cantonese to describe the noun or the verb xiu and tai, hou xiu and hou tai. After looking at the prefix, we are going to look at an example of suffix. In the example, we can see here, yun mei zhu yi, these are four characters. The first two characters mean perfect. And then the third and the fourth character means ism or principle. So when they are put together, it becomes yun mei zhu yi. So it is commonly used in Cantonese when you put zhu yi at the end, it normally means an ideology. So by extension, you can see another example, lui sing zhu yi. Lui sing, the first two characters, female. Zhu yi, again, ism. So it acts as a suffix here. So when you put these four characters together, it means feminism. This expression means feminism. So sometimes you put two characters together to form different meaning. This type of structure is different from the previous two in that the Previous two structures are quite standardized. If you have, for example, ho, and then you will have a sense that it is used to describe an other word that follows. And then zhu yi, if you see these two works, you will understand roughly it is about an ideology. So they are quite standardized and fixed. But in this type of structure, when you put two or more syllables or put two more works together, they can form different meaning. Or if the meanings, if the meaning is not completely different, this meaning can be uh, slightly different from the original one, or it adds more meanings, it adds more meaning to the original character. Here is an example. Do, here, the first syllable, do, means read, and then su means do. And when you put them together, it means study. Of course, they are not mutually exclusive. The meanings of study and the, uh, the wider meaning of study and the literal meaning of read books, they are not mutually exclusive. So which meaning this phrase is conveying often dependent on the context. And then we are going to move to the next part, adverbial constructions. Uh, there are three major forms of using adverbial constructions as modifier. Here, verb plus da, the modifier plus adjective. So the same is, which is quite similar to Mandarin. And then the second construction, adjective plus 
an adverbial construction and then plus verb and then we duplicated adjective plus a adverbial construction and then plus verb so i'm going to give you an example of each of these construction so the first one that uh i put mandarin here just to give you a uh, roadmap maybe some of you are learning mandarin or maybe you have some understanding of mandarin uh, so it is uh, may it, 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 it may not be a bad idea to show you also the uh, Mandarin structure as well, which is quite similar to Cantonese when we use the adverbial duck here in the middle of the sentence. It is just used to describe this action term sing or sang which is good and then uh, uh the uh, adjective and the second construction here is the adjective plus gum is an other adverbial in Cantonese uh, plus verb. Uh, gum. Again, it is used to describe the uh, attitude here. We can see that The first one, the first character, or I, and then might not be ho fairy. Ying zhan means serious, gum thoughts, or you can understand it as in the way and ho study or learning. So I'm not learning. I'm not learning in a way that is serious. So to make it like shorter, I'm not studying it seriously. So gum is used to describe the way he or she or I am studying. So not seriously study. Okay, we have just looked at how an adverbial used to describe a verb, used gum to describe ho. So we are going to look at another example. Here, you can see the example in green. In Cantonese, it is so gai gai means chicken chicken. The sentence has nothing to do with chicken. It is a set phrase in Cantonese. So gai gai is a set phrase in Cantonese. That means doing something quietly. So the gum adverbial here, it is used to describe the way this person, how did this person leave? He left quietly. So if we don't look at the uh, one, two, three, four, the middle four characters here. If we just ignore these characters for now, Koi, Zhao, Zhao, 
he left. We don't know how he left, so we used an adjective, Jing Gai Gai, and then Gong in a way. He or she left in a quiet way. So it means she or he has left quietly. So Jing Gai Gai Gong. So sometimes these kind of adverbial give people a feeling of playfulness as well. So this is the last part of our presentation. These two examples we just look at in the previous two slides. If Uh, if you still remember, in the first sentence, we have in Cantonese. But look at the English meaning here at the bottom. He or she sang, sang very well. Do we know when he sang or when he sang? when he has sung. We don't know. We can't tell when he sang or when he sang from this sentence. Because Chinese, Cantonese doesn't have inflection. And therefore we cannot look at the verb term and know that when it happens. And how are we going to know when something happens? When something happens in the past, in the present time, or in the future? Uh, there are two ways, at least two ways I can show you in these slides, at least two ways. The first one, you add for example, yesterday, you add the phrase or word yesterday, two words in Cantonese, yesterday, man in the middle of the sentence, Koi here, he or she, man if we add it here, ho ho. then we know that it happened last night or it happened yesterday. So add the works to denote the time. So this is one way of doing it. And the second way of doing it is to add an other markers, so here at the end. So in the second sentence, you can see So here, we don't have a particular phrase or word to denote the time. We don't know when it happened, but it has happened. It's in the past. How do we know about that? Because of the word zhuo here at the end of the sentence. So in Cantonese, we also use zhuo uh, as one of the markers to denote something happened in the past. And of course, there are different expressions used to denote uh, something is going to, to denote that something is going to happen in the future. Something <coughs> has not happened yet, or uh, something uh, uh, is happening, or it is not about time. It is just a general meaning, like can be just a phrase or can, can be just a sentence, a general statement to tell the interlocutors that oh, this person is a good singer. So uh, thank you very much for staying till the end. Uh, I hope you have uh, at least a little bit of understanding of Cantonese after this presentation.
Thank you very much. See you.